link right there. So we are recording now. All right. So I'm not sure whether you guys want me to talk about the exam or not, because I can always record the answer. So what I'm going to do is um, typically what I do is I will um, make my script to also generate the key that is specific to your exam. And I'm going to scan your exam. So I have a PDF electronic version. And then the paper version, I can just return it to you. Okay, you guys can keep it for eternity if you want. You can share with your friends. You can make phone copies of that and share with the entire internet. It's all okay with me. Okay. Um, so, and then after that, okay, I will give you the key so that you have the answers to all the questions. Um, you're not going to do your own grading. I still have to do the grading, but at least you, and by that time, you know what the answer is supposed to be, and then you can give yourself you know, some sort of assessment um, you know, before I give you the actual grade. So is that okay? That's kind of you know, how I would proceed to do this in probably the next two weeks or so. You know, it all takes a little bit of time. Uh, because the first thing is to physically, you know, you know, make every single exam go through my scanner. <laughs> so that's going to take some time already. So are there any questions, you know, specific to the exam that you want to ask me or want me to answer today? No questions? Alrighty. Well, if there are no questions, we are continuing with the topics that we are on. So last time we just talked about you know, the concept of a register and a clocked circuit. So today we're gonna go to the other um, components in the processor. So the other components of the processor is, um, you know, there, it's for today's lab. Um, so let me just kinda get into the lab itself. You cannot see it yet, okay? I have not unlocked it for the class yet. Okay. All right. So it has a um, multiplexer, uh, it has a register, and that's it for you know, today's lab, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and talk about what is a multiplexer as well as a register. Now the register part, I'm not gonna talk about because we talked about it in the previous lecture, which is on last Thursday. So we are gonna focus on the concept of a multiplexer. And if we do have time left, then I will continue to talk about the next lab. Okay, so there's another lab here with more you know, processor components. So this one also talks about um, the demultiplexer. Okay, so if we take a preview. So this one also talks about the demultiplexer and also you know, ROM and also RAM. Okay, so those are the components that we need to understand in order to understand how the processor as a whole operates. Once we understand how the processor as a whole operates, then we'll talk about opcode, which are basically control signals so that you know, the, uh, a certain, the controller part of the processor can coordinate all of these various parts to actually get things done. And then only after that, <laughs> we'll talk about the actual opcode and instructions in assembly language programs. So uh, as I might have mentioned to this class, okay, I, I cannot remember which class I mentioned it to, uh, the way I teach this class is to stretch the lower end of your know, computer architecture and not so much the higher end. In other words, you know, this class is a little bit closer to computer engineering than it is to computer science. Whereas you know, Berkeley wants to stretch it on the other side, which makes it closer to computer science than computer engineering. Okay, so there's a distinction between you know how they want to teach this class you know, at Berkeley and you know what they expect from transfer students coming in and what I tend to do because I just I like to figure out how things work. Okay, so that's why I'm building this class here you know, from the ground up, from low level transistors, you know, logic gates and all the way up to the processor and make it program. Any questions up to this point? Any questions? All right, so if there are no questions, I am going to talk about the components. The best way to talk about the components is in LogiSim itself. So you guys can do the same experiments if you want to, but you don't have to. You can just kind of focus on what I am doing, you know, on my screen, okay? And take notes, okay? You know, make sure that you uh, take some notes. So the first thing we'll talk about is what we call a multiplexer. 
So multiplexer and demultiplexer are all your quote-unquote flexors, and they are all under you know this particular category. So we're just going to pull a multiplexer here, and the first thing we want to do with a multiplexer is to examine its properties. Okay, so what what are configurable with a multiplexer? So we can see it has facing, which is the same as all of the components. We can basically rotate the component so it looks good on the circuit that you design. Okay, so that's really kind of superficial. Yes, uh, what is the multiplexer? We'll get to it. Okay, we'll get to what it is. Okay, I think I mentioned I might have mentioned it a little bit that a multiplexer is a switch. It's kind of like a railroad switch where you have multiple incoming railroad connections, but only one outgoing railroad connection. So basically, you have a bunch of trains coming in. They're all stopping at the end, the end, the entry point of the switch. But you have control over which incoming track connects to you to, to the one single outgoing track. So with a railroad switch, you know it's usually not uh, directional, which means it is bidirectional. But the electronic, you know, a multiplexer is definitely uh, directional, where it has multiple input and one single output. The job of the multiplexer is to determine which input connects to the one single output. So it's a fairly simple job, okay? You know, but there are a lot of options with multiplexer. Um, so the next thing we see is the select location. Now select in this case has a very special meaning because the select signal is what is determining which input connects to the output. So the selector is in many ways kind of like the index of array indexing, okay? Because an array has a bunch of elements. The index, when you use the square bracket operator, you are selecting one of the elements of the entire array. The selector of a multiplexer is kind of the same way, okay? It selects which one of the input gets to connect to the output. So is that concept generally okay with you guys? Okay, so just think of it as indexing, okay? You're, you're choosing you know, which input connects to the output. And then the next one down is called the select bit, okay? So this one is kind of important because if you change the select bit, let's say to two, you can see how the multiplexer now has four inputs, zero, one, two, and three. But if you change the select bit to three, what what, how many uh, input ports will you, do you think you'll be expecting? Not nine, it's eight, that is correct, because it's two to the power of the number of select bits. The reason why that is the case is because with three select bits, you can have numbers ranging from zero, 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 all the way up to one, 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 okay? And how many integers do you have in between, including the ends? So zero 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 one zero one zero zero one 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 zero zero one zero one 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 zero and one one one. There are eight of them because each bit can select between a zero and a one, and then we have three of those. So that means we have two to the power of three with the eight. Are you good so far? So one way to visualize. I'm not going to capture this in my notes here. Is if you think about a bit. It has two ways to go because it can be either a zero or a one. Okay, so let's call this your know, bit two. Okay, so bit two can go from zero can either be a zero or one. But when bit two is a zero, bit one can be a zero or one. When bit two is a one, bit one can also be a zero or one. So now we have four-way split. Is that okay? So now if you look at bit zero as the last bit, then it can also be either a one, a zero or one, a zero or one, a zero or one, and then a zero or one. So when you look at you know, how many actual endpoints we have you know, on, in terms of the branches, there are eight of them. So is that okay? It's kind of a graphical way to understand why when you have three bits that you have eight possible numbers. Okay, it's a very visual way to look at it. Is that okay? Yep. Uh, so when you have three bits, does that mean that you're not able to, because it takes a, a, a number of bits to, 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 to,
there are eight ways to arrange the zeros and ones. There are eight ways we have, because you have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, and then finally one, one, one. So each path to get you to the end, to get you to one endpoint, as you traverse the branches, they give you a different three-bit number. So I'm not sure whether I'm addressing your question. Yes, the two to the power of the number of bits. Okay. So when you have three selected, then you have eight input ports. Because you know, with three bits, I can choose any one of the eight input ports because they are all labeled from zero to seven in this case. Okay, all right. So now we go to the next item, which is the number of data bits. So this is really just controlling the width the number of bits per input and output port. So right now they are only one bit wide, but we can make them easier as wide as we need them, need them to be. Okay, so it's no different from the width of your um, input ports and output ports. Okay, the input, input pins and output pins, those can also be configured to, to varying width. So the next one is kind of interesting, okay? Disabled output. Okay, so we'll talk about the last one first before we get to the second to the last. So the last one asks, um, do we want to decrease an enable port? The enable port is this one here. The one that is under the gray dot is always the select one, which means here, this connection here is the one that determines which one of the input connects to the output. This one is an on-off. Okay, it's an enable pin. It is an on-off. So that means that we can actually turn off the entire port. We can say, you know, this particular railroad track is out of service, okay? So now when you say the railroad track is out of service, with a real railroad track, you know, there's not a whole lot of option because it, it simply means no train is gonna go through the switch, right? So all the train has to park, you know, on the back side of the, of the switch. But in this case, because it is electronic, you do have two options. So when a local track set is turned off, because the enable pin, which is also optional, is a zero, then you can control and say, okay, we're gonna output some, uh, we're gonna output all the zeros. That's one option. The second option is a little bit um, confusing. It's called floating. So I'm gonna explain floating here a little bit. What floating means in electronics means I am not trying to specify anything. So imagine this, okay? So imagine that you have a, um, like you think of something that is, that has a similar, you have a physical manifestation. Okay, so we, we can do this, okay? So let's just say that you have a voltmeter, right? That may not work because you know, that requires some experience in electronic technology. I have to find an analogy where it does not require any specific knowledge. Hmm, I need something that has a default position or some actual position, and then you can make it go you know, in either direction you know, when, it, when you want to actually push on it. Let me see. Has to be kind of some kind of a spring-loaded thing that has a default value, but then you can also push it to you know, two additional possible values. Huh? A rocket switch? Okay. So we can think about a momentary, yeah. So if you think about a momentary, you know, rocket switch, okay, so this is the leader of the rocket switch. So typically, you know, um, this is a momentary uh, rocket switch, which means you know, if nobody's touching it, it's not connecting anything, okay? But it is spring loaded. So that means you can push the leader on this side, and then it's going to make a connection from this end to whatever this end is. Or you can push the lever to the other side, where it will make a connection from that end to this end here. But if you don't push it, it's not making connection from either side. Is that okay as an example? Okay. 
So we call this to be the float position, which means normally it is not connecting to anything. So from the electronic perspective, it means that on one side we have a constant one, on the other side we have a constant zero, and this is the actual output port of the device. So when it is floating, it is actually, the output is actually not connecting to anything. It is just a wire that is not connected to any electrical signal, okay? So that means, you know, so we have a choice here to determine whether the output of the multiplexer is floating, which means I'm not gonna specify any zero or one, okay? Or we can make it to output just zero. So we'll get back to this one just a little bit because I want you guys to see what you would see when something is floating. Because floating is kind of tricky, okay? Because I'm basically saying there's no voltage applied to a wire. But when you hook up an actual multimeter, you'll, you're always going to see a number, right? So how does that work? So we'll, we'll see from the visual perspective how this is going to work. All right. So I'm going to change the design a little bit here so that I can actually illustrate the design. So I go back to the multiplexer, and instead of having eight input ports, I switch it back to four. And uh, we'll keep everything else the same, okay? It's going to have a floating disabled output and also having an enable pin so that I can, the, the device can be disabled. And then we'll, oh, we'll also change the um, number of data bits to, let's say, three, okay? So that means everything else would also need to be three bit wide, like so. And then I just need to make a bunch of these, four of, four of these to be exact. And then one output pin that is also going to be three bit wide because the number of bits for the input and the number of bits for the output, they must agree, okay? So this is going to connection uh, input zero this is going to input one, this is going to input two, and finally this is going to input four, and then I have two extra pins, okay? So uh, this one is gonna select which one of the input connects to the output. This one needs to be two bit wide, because in order to designate whether I want input zero, one, two, or three is going to connect to the output, I need two bits to do it. Because with two bits, I have four possible ways to arrange the zeros and ones, okay? And then finally, we have the enable, okay? Which is also going to be, this one is a single bit. Because all I need to specify is a, a one in order for the device to be turned on and a zero in order for the device to be turned off. So right now, your know, logic scene is already running. And instead of having all zeros as the input, let's make these you know, kind of unique, okay? So that they are not the same. So we can have one as zero, one, zero. The other next one is one, one, zero. This one can be zero, one, one. And this one here can be one, zero, one. All I want to do is to make sure that all four inputs have different values. Okay, so that's what I'm, that's all I'm gonna try to do here. All right, so the device is off right now. Okay, because what, how do we know it's off? Because the enable pin is a zero. So that means the railroad switches would go out of order. No train is going to do the switch. But because we specified with the switch, okay, let me click on the switch so we can see. But because we specified the switch to have floating output when it is disabled, so that's why we see XXX as the output pin, because the symbol X is basically saying that particular signal is unknown. We don't know what it is because nobody is trying to specify either a one or zero. It is simply not. Is that okay? So the letter X in an output pin, or even on a wire, is basically saying, okay, you can actually see that on a wire as well. If you click on this wire, you would also see you know, XXX and then slash question mark, question mark, question mark, which is basically saying, we don't know anything about any one of the three individual wires of this pin. Is that okay? All right, okay. So obviously when the device is off, it doesn't do anything interesting at all, okay? All it's gonna say is, I don't know what the output is supposed to be, okay? But before we move on and turn it on, let's change the device, okay? So we'll go back to the multiplexer 
And this time we'll change the disabled output from floating to all zeros. Okay. So that's what it does. Okay. When the device is off, in this case, your um, disabled output specification will determine what it is actually going to output if it is going to output something. So this is one of the two options. The first option was floating, where we saw XXX, and this is the other option where we specify if the, if the device is turned off, we're just, a, we are just going to output a constant of zero for the output. Is that okay? All right, okay. So now that we know this kind of behavior, let's go ahead and turn it back on, okay? Let's turn on the multiplexer. And before we turn it on, we already see that it's selecting input zero, zero, which is zero. So let's change this, okay? Let's change it to something else. Um, of the remaining three, which one do you guys want me to connect it to? You can choose one, two, or three. Three, okay, so three is one one in binary. So now when I turn it on, I should see one zero one, which is the input of the, the third input to connect to the output. So the output should also become one zero one. There we go, all right. So as you change the selected, it, the output would also change at the same time. For instance, if I say I want to change the input to just zero one, then the output would immediately change to one one zero. So just watch this. There we go. Is that okay? That is a multiplexer, okay? It is basically the same thing as a railroad switch where you have multiple incoming tracks and only one outgoing track, and then you have a control here, okay, where you can select which one of the input track connects to the output track. But you also have an, op you also have an optional control of whether the switch is even functional or not. If it is not functional, then you also can control you know, whether the output is portable floating, which means we are not gonna specify any value at all, or it is going to be all zeros. So all those are all the things that you can um, you, you can specify with a multiplexer. Is uh, yep. Go ahead. Making sure I understand it. Yeah. Go ahead. So it's uh, almost the point of this is to actually have the multiplexer go to the input yeah. address and have it designate that for the output. You are selecting which one of the inputs connects to the output. You can only connect up to one of the inputs to the only output of the input. And you can say none of them. You can just say disable the entire system. At what point do you get to the use case? Oh, we'll get to the use case. Okay, because right now we're just describing the individual components of the processor because you'll. Without this discussion, then we cannot talk about how the processor as a whole operates. So we're only talking about components right now. All right. So generally speaking, okay, in the context of a processor, um, the input can be the output of multiple registers, and then the output of the multiplexer can connect to the input, which is the D port of a register. So this way we can say, oh, I want this register to update that register over there. I can choose which register is gonna be used to provide value to either do some computation or to update another register, okay? So there are very specific uses of your multiplexers. It's used actually quite a lot in, a, um, in the processor. So we're gonna go move on to the next item. Okay, so add circuit. And let me check what is the next component that I should demonstrate. This is the next lab. So we'll focus on the lab for today first, and then we'll talk about the other one. <clears throat> oh, I forgot to mention one more thing. So let me go ahead and mention that before I forget. So the other device that we, <laughs> in today's lab, is a register. So we already talked about the register. So in the lab, we are, you know, this is the kind of question that you get in the lab, which is basically saying, you know, what is going to happen if I make changes to ports A, B, C, D, and R 
ABC means the state of R as like E. And so what is going to happen to E? Okay, that's the question. So we'll we'll take a look at this one. Okay, so you can see how the answers is. Uh, e ends up to be a 4, E ends up to be a 7, or E ends up to be a 0. So you have to figure that out, okay, you know, which one is the correct answer. So basically what we are asking here is do you know how a register operates? So let me go back to LogiSim because I remember that's one thing that I really need to talk about but I forgot to talk about it. So let's go back to just main which is demonstration circuit for multiplexer. You can go to help. Okay, this is built in, it doesn't go out to the internet, which means even without in any internet connections, you can still get to this help, okay, because it's all built in. Then you go to library, okay, library reference, and you can see in the library reference, it has, you know, the same category, you know, as in the main screen. Then you go to plexers, you go to multiplexer, and here we have the full explanation of the multiplexer and what each port is doing in the context of a multiplexer. So this is basically another way you can find information or another way you can find a description of what a multiplexer does and how it gets the job done. Is that okay? So I think this is important, okay? Because you know, I just gave you guys a verbal description along with a demonstration, but this is another resource for you to also read in order to understand how the multiplexer works. Okay, all right. So now we're going to move on to the register. Even though I said, you know, we really do not need to talk about the register, but we'll talk about it anyway. So a register is under memory. So if you want to play with a register, it is under memory. So you just pull a register out like so. And the first thing we do, once again, is to look at all the properties of a register. You can control the number of data bits of a register. So the default is eight, but you can change it to just about any number, okay, after a certain uh, upper limit. A one-bit register is really a resettable, edge-sensitive, gated uh, D flip flop, okay? So we talked about this last Thursday, I believe, okay? So if you make the number of data bits all the way down to one, and it's just a D flip flop, okay, which is not terribly useful, but an A bit register is capable of remembering a byte, so it is it's quite useful. So the next item here is called the trigger. Um, all the registers in the processor, except for one, is going to trigger on the rising edge. The um, there are a few other you know, alternatives here. The only other one that we use in the processor is the following. So in this case, the trigger is the same as the clock. Okay, so when we talk about D flip flops, do you remember we talked about CLK, which is the clock? But I also said, you know, well, you can kind of look at CLK as put, okay? Because when there's a transition of the clock going from zero to one, that is when we change its register, okay? Um, label is no big deal, it's really just the name of the register, how you want it to display. And then finally, we have the label part, which is also just cost data. Okay? So let's go ahead and connect stuff to this register and we'll see what it does and how it gets the job done. So we'll have you know, two input, one input pin, which is 8 bit wide, because that's going to connect to the input port. Okay, there we go. We're going to have one. Um, output pin, which is also going to be a bit wide, it connects to Q, which is the output port, and then we'll have three additional pins. So these are all your know, kind of individual pins. So we did something like this already when we talked about the clock circuit, where we see a counter counting up. I hope you guys remember that. Okay. So with that one, you know, we uh, we have a second component, we, which is a an adder in the circuit. But this one will just make it as simple as possible. So we just have single bit you know, connected to these control signals. And then we just want to figure out you know, what, you know, what we can do with a register. First thing first, okay, you can always force a specific value in a register. All you need to do is to switch to the focus tool, the media finger tool, and then you click on the register, and you will see the actual value of the register. 
highlight it in red as a with the direction. So that means whatever you type on the keyboard, as long as you're typing from zero to nine and then A to F, that is gonna be entered into the value of the register. You can force the register to have a particular value. For instance, if I type your six E right now, six E, you can see how the register is now updated to a value of six E. And the output port, which is port two, is always going to output the value of the register. So in this case, six in the hexadecimal uh, conversion is zero one one zero, okay, right here. And then the E is one 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 zero, which is also one zero. So if you have not made your own hexadecimal to binary conversion thing, <laughs> this is a quick and easy way to do it, okay? In fact, yeah. This is a quick and easy way to do phase conversion. All right, so let's just say that I want to change it, okay? I want to change the value of this register. Um, okay, I take it back. Let's say we want to reset it, okay? So let's say this is the, the random value that somehow ended up in the register when you first power up the computer. So remember, you don't want random values in everything you know, when you start up a computer, so we need to reset it. So in this case, the reset is what we call active high, which means when it is a one, it's doing what it is supposed to do. The reset pin is labeled zero. So when we put a one into that pin, the output and also the state of the register gets reset to all zeros. Is that okay? All right. So we have to release the reset before we can do anything else, because as long as the reset pin, which is labeled zero, which is also known as clear, is a one, the, the value of the register will always remain to be zero, zero, okay? Which is not terribly useful unless you're just starting up the computer. All right, so now we want to say, let, let's say we want to change the, uh, the value of the register to, let's say, mm, D9, okay? So the question now is how do we specify D9 in binary? So let's start with the most significant bit. So what is D in base two? Sorry? No, B is not 13, A is 10, so B is 11. So how do we specify 11 using four bits? One zero one one is correct, because it has one eight, no four, one two, that makes 10 already, and then one finally one one, so that adds up to 11 in base 10. And I said nine, so nine is eight plus one. This is the eight, this is the one. So now we have everything here. And you guys go like, how do we know this is actually D9 in hexadecimal? You can click on this wire. Attack, I don't see D9 here. That's because you can actually control what base and how, to, uh, how Logitech interprets the individual bits. If you want to change the interpretation of this, what you do is you go to window, you go to preferences, and then you go to, oh, I have to remember where it is. Uh, window, layout, nope, nope, okay, maybe not this one. <laughs> Let's try it, um, hmm? under layout, layout, right, second and first. So we can change either one or both. So the first one is whatever is to the left-hand side of the slash, that is the first number or the first representation. Radix is really just the base, okay? So when you see the word radix, is it's the base. So you can change it to octo, which is base eight, signed decimal, okay? We know we should know what is signed decimal at this point, and also unsigned decimal, and also hexadecimal, which is base 16. So if I change it to base 16, close window, and probably have to poke it again, now it is in base 16. Is that okay? So it's a nifty trick, okay, you know, because you know, sometimes we want to see it in hexadecimal, other times we want to see it in binary and so on and so forth. So you actually get to control that. When you exit from uh, Logisim, it actually saves this setting. So remember, if you change something, you know, it sticks with your Logisim. <clears throat> All right, so next, what do we do? Well, I think we have to enable, okay? So enable, okay, let me click somewhere else. First, there we go. So this is the enable port. 
So the enable port has to become a one first before the clock is even used. So you have to enable the clock, enable the turn the enable to a one first. This is the clock, which looks like a triangle. Okay, I know it's kind of funny looking, but that's the clock. So this is where the edge sensitivity comes in, uh, becomes important because I specify this register by default to be rise and edge sensitive, which means when the clock pin goes from zero to one, then we are going to do you know the input, which is. Uh, 1011-1001, that will be then be used to update the register, which also changes its output automatically. Is that okay? So we're going to do it, okay? So we're going to have a rising edge at the clock pin, changing this from 0 to 1, and now we have the register changing to B9, and also the output changing to the binary bit pattern of B9 at the same time. Do we have any questions about the operation of a register? Most of this should be a repetition of what we already talked about last Thursday. We good? Yep. This is a way for us to remember the value of something. So whatever you wanted to remember, you have to present it here. But then, if you wanted to remember something, you have to make, you have to make sure that the E N or the enable is a one, and then the clock needs to have a rising edge. Okay. All right. So I, I have to kind of explain myself a little bit here, okay? Because I kept referencing this is what we talked about last week, and so on and so forth. So why do you think I kept mentioning all of that stuff? I want to annoy everybody in this class, right? Okay? No, because I want to make sure that you guys understand that we have already talked about something, and you might want to double check to see you have taken notes you know, when we talked about it the first time. Because if you did not, then you know it tells you what you need to do in the future. Okay? So this is basically my way of helping you to understand you know, what your notes should have. Okay, so that's the reason why you know I would you know tell you guys oh we talked about this last week or the week before last you know because I want you to understand that if you have taken notes that should be on your notes already now can you remember all of that stuff that I have mentioned in this class no I'm not expecting you to do that either but I do expect you to write down some notes because there's a okay I know I'm digressing but it is an important digression I might have talked about this already as well so note taking second brain, okay? There's an actual book. Somebody wrote a book that compares note taking to building a second brain. So the, the, there's an, an, a whole website and you know, the guy is selling a bunch of books and apps and whatnot. But the whole idea is if you take notes, it is equivalent to expanding your brain. Um, because your brain, has a short-term memory, which is you know, basically all the things that you can kind of quickly uh, remember, and none of that needs to have any relationship. So you're not relying on how things relate. You're simply you're brute forcing to remember things, like a phone number. Okay. So if I tell your phone number, like you know three nine seven one six seven two, okay, can you quickly remember that? I'll be the first one to say uh, nope. I I cannot even I remember three is one of the numbers. That's all I can remember even though I came up with that number, okay? That's the limitation of your short-term memory. In order to understand a concept, you're trying to make your relationship between the concepts, which means you need to know what concept you're trying to make connections between first. So if that number is already exceeding like five or seven, which is what your short-term memory is capable of, then what are you gonna do? The answer is notes, okay? You write it down. So that you can actually see or read back, you know what you have, what what concept you're trying to make connections in between, and then you can then focus on one or two at a time. So that's why writing notes is so important, because you know, your brain's capacity of remembering things that are not related is really limited. Okay, and notes gives you a way to bypass that limit. So I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Um, you can. You'll find other you know, resources that talks about you know, how to take notes. 
um, you just do a Google search or go to chat to GPT, you know, what are some of the best ways or best practices to take notes, you know, those are actually going to be, it's going to be useful not only for this class, because you are all you know, transitioning to a four-year university in a year or two, so it's going to be helpful, it's even more helpful once you transfer. Okay, so getting back to this one, okay, the next question is, can we find built-in help for register? The answer is yes. So you go to the same library reference, and then you go to memory this time, and then you go to register, not shift register, okay? Just sim simple register, and that basically describes what I just talked about, but this is all written, which means you can read it over and over again, as opposed to trying to remember what I said and try to jot down all the notes at the same time. So are we doing okay so far with a register? Okay, all right, so since we have time, we're gonna move on to what we call a demultiplexer, okay? What we call, it is also called a mux. A multiplexer is also called a mux, okay? So in other words, if I want to name this particular circuit, which is just a test circuit for a multiplexer, I can just call it mux, because you know, that's the, um, I would say that's the industry standard as an abbreviation for a multiplexer. So now we're gonna build another circuit to illustrate how a demultiplexer works. A demultiplexer is called a demux, okay? So a demultiplexer is also a switch. You know, think of it as a railroad switch. Can somebody just guesstimate, okay, what kind of a switch it is? A multiplexer is a switch that has multiple incoming tracks and only one outgoing track. So with a D multiplexer, can somebody guess how that description should go? One outgoing arm. Exactly, it has one incoming track and multiple outgoing tracks. Okay, so that means you know. Okay, so let's just say that you have a main trunk. Okay, you have, you have like a railroad track that can connect either to a platform where passengers can you know, get on and off via the cars, and you also have another track that goes to a factory where you can unload your finished products, your grain and whatnot you know, onto those cars, okay? So now you have a track, that one single incoming track and two outgoing tracks. And then you have one select bit because all you need is a, either a zero or one. So let's say zero goes to the platform where passengers can get on and off and then the one will get you to the grain granary where you can unload all the grain onto the cars, okay? So let's go ahead and check it out, okay? So we go to plexers, and then this time we go to a demultiplexer, and then we just take a look at this and look at all the uh, selection, all the, all the uh, properties of a demultiplexer. So some of these is not really too exciting, okay? Phasing is just rotating the device. Uh, select location, which is where the gray dot is, it allows me to specify whether it's down or up picture looks nicer in some cases. So those are not super duper important. And then we see select bits again, okay? In this case, by default, it is one, which means I can select one of the three output ports, okay? Because you know, two to the power of one is two. So if I change the select bit from one to two, just like what I did with the multiplexer, now we have four output ports. If I change it to three, then we have eight output ports and so on. Is that okay? So this is very similar to exactly what we talked about earlier with a multiplexer because a demultiplexer is really just like a multiplexer except the direction is opposite, okay? So let's go back to two. The number of data bits, once again, can be any number in the processor because this is what we call, quote unquote, an A-bit processor, which means the path of data is A-bit wide. So that means most of the time we pick the number of data bits for every component to be eight, okay? There are a few exceptions, but in general, it is A-bit wide. Um, and then we have, um, once again, we have you know, a, an option to see whether enable is one of the pins, and in the default is yes, okay? We have enable as one of the pins, which means that we can disable the entire switch, which means if a train arrives at the incoming track, we can just say that, well, this, this switch is out of order, nobody's coming out. Is that okay? 
Also, just as you know, we can control the disabled output of a multiplexer, we can also change or configure the disabled output of a demultiplexer. <coughs> and once again, we only see the zero versus the floating. But in this case, if it is zero, it goes to zero for all the output ports, not just one, because you remember, we are not selecting anything if the device is off. And then we have tri-state, which is new. So tri-state does not, um, is something that is only for a demultiplexer, but it is not for a multiplexer. So three stage is basically saying, there. what, what state are we talking about? So usually we only have two states, which is either a zero or a one. A three stage means not care or not specified is the third state. So you have one, you have zero, and then you have, I'm not gonna specify anything as quote unquote the third state, okay? So now the question is, um, so how does that work, right? You know, what does the three state thing work in this context? So we're gonna do some experiments Okay, you know, because I want to illustrate you know, you know, what you can do when you say, I'm not really sure what this means and I don't, I'm too lazy to read the documentation. I want to figure it out by experimentation. So how do we do that? All right, so let's go ahead and do some experiments. I'm gonna change the uh, data bits to three, just like the other one. So now the only input uh, pin here needs to be three bit wide that connects to the input of the switch. And then all of the output ones also need to be three bit wide. And I need a bunch of these, so I'm gonna do a duplicate, okay. And then select both of these and duplicate again, so this way you know, I can quickly get to four without having to replicate the same thing four times. Okay. And now I output, output zero goes to this one, output one goes to this one, Output two goes to the next one, and output three goes to the very last one. <clears throat> and then two additional input pins, okay? One input pin is just for enable and disable. It is a single bit. And then the other one is gonna be two bit wide because we have two select bits. So this is gonna be two bit wide in order to select which uh, the input should connect to which of the output. All right. So LogiSim is already doing the simulation right now because the demultiplexer has an enable pin and the enable pin is a zero. So that means the demultiplexer is turned off at this point. Okay, it is not letting any incoming train to go through the switch to any one of the output tracks, okay? But because we also specify that we want the disabled output to be floating and that's why you see all four output of the demultiplexer to be all X's because you know, they're all basically floating. And remember, floating means I'm not specifying a one or a zero, so they're all not care, okay, all X's. So that means if I go back to the demultiplexer and change the disabled output to zero, then we see all zeros as the output. Are we doing okay so far with this? This is consistent with what we already understood about a multiplexer. So we'll go back and switch the uh, disabled output back to floating. So now the question is, okay, if that is you know, specifying the output already, what is the three state thing doing? The three state is applicable when the device is off, okay? In other words, disabled output is specific when the, when the device is off, in other words, enable is a zero. But when able is a one, okay, the device is on, then the tri-state thing becomes useful, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, what happens when we specify, you know, either yes or no for the three state. So the default is no, okay? So we'll go ahead and you'll make the input some particular pattern because you know, we don't want it to be we we don't want it to be zero 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 because that can easily be confused with oh you're just you specifying all zeros for the disabled output so we're going to specify let's say one one zero as our input the device is still off okay so that's why it is not you know outputting anything yet so we'll go ahead and also specify this to be one zero in other words um, once I turn on the 
vector, I am expecting the input, which is 110, to be presented to output 2, which is over here. Okay, so output 2 should become 110 as I enable the device by turning the enable pin from 0 to a 1. I think that part we, we all get, right? You know, that's the whole purpose of a demultiplexer. The question is what happens to the other three outputs of the demultiplexer? Should, should they all be zeros or should they all be continue to be xxx? That is the question. So it depends on how we configure that you're correct. So it depends on how we configured the demultiplexer. The way this demultiplexer is, demultiplexer is configured is we turn off three state, which means it can it is only capable of outputting a zero or a one when it is enabled. So that means all the ones that are not connected to the input are going to be all zeros. Okay. So now we try to confirm that understanding. We go to the poking tool again, and then we enable the device. And sure enough, only output two is the actual value of the input, and everybody else are zeros. So now we can go back to the device and say, wait, 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 this is not what I want, okay? I want every output that is not the selected one to be XXX. In other words, I don't want to specify any particular value for the ones that are not selected when the, when the D multiplexer is turned on. So you go to the three state and you make it yes. So that's how, that's what it affects, okay? So three state affects a demultiplexer that is turned on, that is enabled. Disabled output only affects the demultiplexer when it is turned off. Now whether a demultiplexer can be turned on and off depends on whether you include an enable pin. If you say yes to include an enable pin, that means you have control over whether the device is on or off, if you do not, if you specify a no, but you specify yes, include enable, that device is always on. Are we good with that? Okay, all right. So I know this is a lot, okay? And that's why I designed the lab experiments to actually have you to go through a lot of these things to figure it out, okay? Because when you do it by hand, that's another way that your brain learns, okay? When you listen to me, that's one. When you watch me do it, that's another one. When you do it by yourself, that's the third way, okay? And if you teach each other, okay, if you kind of do work as a group and you're, you're having a conversation, that's actually the fourth way. Because when we talk about something, it also exercises a different pathway in your brain. All right, so that's the uh, demultiplexer. And if you go to help, you can also find you know, the description of a demultiplexer. It's right here. And you know, this is basically Logisim's you know, built-in help, which explains the same thing. Um, it may be a little bit more concise. You know, it's definitely not interactive. You know, it's not visual. So you know, if you already have a general idea, but you're just forgetting like one little thing about you know, one of these pins, you can go back and read this part here. All right. Looking at the time, we still got time here. So the next item I want to illustrate is, uh, let's take ROM first, okay? So we'll go ahead and add another circuit, and this time we are illustrating what a ROM is and how it operates. So ROM also belongs to memory. It has its own little icon here. This is ROM. First of all, what is ROM? What is it? It's an abbreviation, read only, Okay, very good. So that means it is a form of memory, kind of like a register, but not really like a register in many other ways because you cannot change it, you cannot update it. It is called read-only memory. So that means, you know, okay, so let's take a look at, you know, the attributes of a ROM first. It has an address bit width. It also has a data bit width. Okay, so let's think about, you know, how to what these two are and what each one does. Address bit width is basically saying, okay, if I want to specify one of the many items in the ROM, how many bits do I need to specify one of the many items or locations inside the ROM? 
it's analogous to the range of indexes into an array. You're, you're basically trying to specify the range of values as indexes into an array. But you're not specifying the range directly, you're specifying the number of bits that are needed to specify the full range. Okay, so I'm gonna change address bit width to four. Can someone tell me with four bits, how many locations can I specify? <laughs> so remember this picture here? You just need to go one level more because this is three bits. Yep, 16. Okay, because 2 to the power of 4 is 16. So if I change the address bit width to 4, that means I have 16 locations inside the ROM. So there we go. It doesn't seem to change anything, but you know, it is actually changed. So the next question is, for each location in the ROM, there's 16 of those, how many bits do I want to be able to store for each location? There's no number that you have to go with, okay? So you can go with some really kind of strange numbers here, such as 11 bits, okay? If that is what you want, you can have it, okay? So now each location can store 11 bits and there are 16 locations. So are we doing okay so far in terms of what the address bit width is trying to specify and what the data bit width is trying to specify? One controls the number of locations, but we are not controlling the actual number of locations. We're controlling the number of bits to express a location, which is basically just an unsigned integer. The other one, which is data bit width, specifies how many bits do we want each location to store and it can be some really kind of odd you know, location. To change the content of ROM, there are a few ways to do it. Okay, you can you know, click here. So you can basically, whatever is in the red uh, triangle, you can change it. But this method does not work when your ROM has too many locations. So the best way to change the location, your content, is to right click on the ROM and then go to edit content. So it would open up an editor like this, I know it, it, it's, it's difficult to read because it wants to fit 16 locations on a row, okay? So now we have location zero, location one, location two, location three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is location 10, which is also known as location A in hexadecimal, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so whenever, you know, whichever one you click on, you can just over, you, you can type over it. So we do okay so far in terms of understanding you know, how the internal content of a ROM is arranged. You can look at it as an array that is initialized, but it's a const. So that means that you cannot change the content of ROM when the logic in, when logic in is running. Is that okay? All right. So what is the purpose of ROM in a modern day computer? Is, is there a ROM you know, somewhere on your phone, on your, on your computer? The answer is, I hope so, okay? Because not every phone has a ROM. Some phones only has flash memory, which means you can, if you try hard enough, you can actually break your phone, break. B-R-I-C-K, not B-R-E-A-K. So what does it mean when we say breaking your phone? B-R-I-C-K. You're turning your phone into a brick. <laughs> because your phone cannot recover if it's broken. Okay, you can mess it up to the point where it is not recoverable. Okay, if you, you can upload the wrong firmware, okay? And the phone just goes like, okay, this is the wrong firmware for me. I cannot, I don't know what to do, and it just collapses. And there's no way to recover from it. So that's called breaking a phone, okay? And those are the phones without an actual true ROM. Because there, there's no um, fail-safe ROM, okay, that always runs, okay? So with a phone that has a ROM, that means no matter how you messed it up, there's always a combination of you know, pressing the buttons while it, you know, when you power up that it will go back to the original ROM that always works. It's a 
Are they perfect? No, because you know, the bomb has to be determined when the, when the phone left the factory. But is it going to get to a mode where you can reprogram it again? Yes, okay? So there are two different kinds of phones, you know, the ones that can, you can actually break and the ones that you cannot break because you know, it always has a fallback that is not going away. It is not reprogrammable, reprogrammable. It's always going to be there, okay? So even in modern day computers, ROM is still relevant because of that, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna look at you know, how do we interact with a ROM. So we can see the ports, there are only three ports of a ROM. That's the address port, which is A, that's the data port, which is B, and there's also the select port, which is SEL. So we are now gonna specify you know, the input pins corresponding to each one, and then we'll try to see what it can do. The select in this case is actually not the same as the select you know, for um, the multiplexer or the demultiplexer. This select actually is acting more like an EN, okay, enabled. So that means you can have a whole bunch of ROM chips on your computer. Depending on which one is selected, that is the only one that actually will output something. All the ROM chips that are not selected will basically act as if it is not even there. So just remember, okay, this SEL is more like EN, okay? Think of it as enable. The data port, okay, which is, oh, let me get, take, I take it back. The address port, in this case, you know, it is four bit wide, so we have to make the input pin also four bit wide. This one specifies if the device is enabled, which location do you want me to look at? In other words, the address port is the kind of stuff that you put inside square brackets when you are using an array. If you think about the ROM or the content of a ROM as an array, the address port is the expression inside the square bracket. It allows you to specify a particular element in the entire array. Is that analogy working okay? All right. So that leaves us with only the um, data port. The data port is really just the output of the entire thing, which is the value of the location that you have selected, that you have chosen, or you have addressed. Okay, so all of those terms are basically referencing the same thing. So that is basically just you know, when, the, when the device is enabled, the output data, the data port as an output is going to give you the content at the location that you have selected. So this is not going to be very interesting until I put something into these values here. So we can put in you know, some kind of funky values, okay? 1FD, 0 to 6, um, 1, 2, 3. Because it's an 11-bit thing, so that means I can only go from 0 to 7 for the most significant digit. So I can have 7FF, which is the largest value. This, this, is, all gonna, this is going to be all ones. Um, I'll leave this one as a 0, 0, 0. And this one I can have like 5. Um, 5A5 five five is going to be an interesting pattern. This one I can make it a, you know, 317. I'm just picking up some you know, random values here. Uh, this one I can make it a, I cannot put an 8, okay? So if you try to say 800, zero, zero, it doesn't work, okay? Because 8 is more than what this hexadecimal digit can represent because it really only has 3 bits. Because we have 3 bits here, 4 bits here, and then 4 bits here. So we have, uh, we'll say 477, seven, and then finally here we have 404. Okay, there we go. All right, so the device is off, okay? Because you can see the SEL, which I said earlier, you know, think of it as SEN, okay, that's enabled. Because it is disabled right now, the output are all basically floating, because, you know, I, as I said a little bit earlier, if the device is disabled, it is as if it doesn't exist. So it, it doesn't interfere with the operation of anybody else. So that the only way to do that is for, that, for the data port to be all floating. It's not trying to specify a zero or one with any of the bits. All right, so let's just say that we want the output to reflect 5A5. What should the data port be specifying? In other words, what should be the zeros and ones here? If 
if I want 5A5. Zero one zero zero because that's how four is expressed as a binary number. So you are absolutely correct. Okay, if I just put a one at this location, that then the output. Oh wait, I forgot one thing. Why is the output still X? Because I forgot to enable it. Yep, that's right. So let's enable it. Okay. So is that really five A five? So there's an implicit zero here. So the first or the most significant digit in hexadecimal is really zero one zero zero, which is five. The next four bits is one zero one zero, which is the A, and then the least significant four bits are zero one zero one, which is the last five or the rightmost five. Is that okay so far? And as you, as soon as you change the address port the output would also change. So let's say we want to go from 0101 to 0110. So what should be the output when we change the address port to 0110? What would be the output at the data port? It will be the bit pattern for 477, which is 100011111. Let's double check, put a one here, and then the output is one zero zero for the four, zero one 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 for the seven, and then once again, zero one 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 for another seven. So is that okay? So that's the way a ROM operates, okay? Fairly simple. The one thing that you probably just need to remember is it is an initialized array of integers implemented in hardware. I think that's the best way to describe it. Is that okay? All right. So um, the way I'm trying to explain these things is to try to give you an analogy to something that you already understand, okay? Because you have taken CISP 300 and also 360, so the concept of an array should be okay with you guys, and that's what I'm trying to relate to you. But remember, this is a const array, which means you know, when the program is running, when this whole thing is running, you cannot change the content. It cannot be used to remember something that you need to remember as you go through an algorithm. Okay? So we are gonna we have just a little bit of time. You know, I'm gonna get started. I may not have enough time to finish the entire RAM discussion, which is okay because today's lab is just on the multiplexer and the register. Yes. Say again? A ROM cannot be reset. That's kind of the whole point of a ROM is you cannot reset it. You know, once you determine the content, it stays there. So in a simulator, it is different, okay? In a simulator, you can always click on something and actually force the value to change. But in a real device, you know, as a ROM component, once the content is determined from factory, nobody can change it anymore. Is that? Does that address your question? Okay. So the last one that I'm going to mention, I don't think we have time today to finish the entire thing, is RAM. So the question is, what is RAM? ROM is read-only memory. So most people think RAM is read-something memory, but that's not the case. Random access, okay? And of course, you know, most people in this country will also think of a truck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but that is not it either. It's random access memory, which is kind of strange, okay? You know, because I don't know how they come up with those names. <clears throat> so we go to RAM here, okay? We just stash it here. We go like, okay, there's, there are a few more pins here, okay? You can see a few more ports. That's the A port, that's the D port, and the SEL port, just like a ROM. And then we have three additional ones, okay? So we're gonna go through those and try to figure out what they do. Same thing, okay, address bit width is controlling the width of the integer to specify a location in the ROM. We tried uh, four last time, so we can go ahead and change it to maybe six this time, okay? And data bit width is um, what is the width of each location, um, and you know, this the default is eight, we can just kind of keep it as eight, okay? We'll just keep it as eight. The last one, we are not gonna change you know, for the processor that we are gonna use. Um, 
It's basically asking, do we have one single port for both input and output? The B port is now bidirectional, which means it can be used to reflect the value of a location in the RAM, but it can also be used to update the content of a location in the RAM. In other words, you can think of a RAM as a ROM where the content can be overwritten as the program executes. So the, I guess the other way to call this is call this a RWM, read write memory. I think that, we, that makes a whole lot more sense to me, RWM instead of RAM, but RWM is really hard to pronounce and there's no acronym to pronounce it, right? You, how do you call it? Rum, rum. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so we'll, we'll now take a look at you know, what you know, these things do. So because we changed the number of um, address bits to six, we should be seeing 64 locations. But nope, we're only seeing how many? 16 of the 64 locations. So that's the limitation of changing the values using this particular interface. But if you right click on it and go to edit content, then you actually get to see all 64 locations like this. So this is a good time, you know, I mean, this may be the last thing I'm going to talk about today, is how do we look at the hex or hexadecimal editor in logic systems? The leftmost column is italicized, okay? You know, from your perspective, it may not look very italicized, but it is. Those are the addresses of the first location on each row in hexadecimal. So that means, okay, I'm going to use the mouse pointer here so it's easier to point out. So if I need to figure out the actual address of this location, the first thing I need to do is to find out at the very beginning of the row what is the number. In this case, it's two zero. Don't call, don't say it is 20 because it is not, okay? It is two zero in hexadecimal. So this is location actually two zero, two one, two two, two three, two four, two five, two six, two seven, two eight. This is location two okay all right so I want to make sure that we know how to count the locations okay so that when I refer to a specific location you know where to find it um, and just like with the ROM if you want to force a change to these locations you can just type over it so if I want to change this location to 7e I just type by 7e over here if I want to change this location to 6f I just type 6f over that okay um, we only got one minute left, so I don't think we have enough time to really go over everything. I will give you an overall description of the ports, and then we'll finish this experiment next Tuesday. You can also do something like what I did with the other controllers today. You can just kind of make a simple circuit, and make a bunch of input pins, potentially an output pin, and then just exercise it, okay? All right, address port does the same thing as with a ROM. All it does is specify a location inside the device. Now, since we have six bits for the address bit, so that means we have 64 locations for this bit. Okay, so that part has not changed. Uh, select does the same thing as the ROM, which means, okay, don't think of it as select as a multiplexer or an e-multiplexer. Think of it as EN, NAD, okay? Does the same thing as the EN. Data port does it about the same thing, okay? So we'll, I'll explain why it is about the same thing. Clear, CLR, is doing the same thing as a reset. Basically, you know, when you power up the processor, the clear should connect to a reset, you know, reset pin so that you can actually turn all the content of RAM into zeros, okay? So it does the same thing as the reset of a register. Look at this symbol here. What does that remind you of, the little triangle? clock port of a register, okay? And you are correct. It does the same thing as a clock port of a register. So that means, you know, by default, when you want to update a location in the RAM, it will only do the update on a rising edge of the clock. It is only when the clock has a transition from zero to one that it will take the input from the B port to change the location address 
So that leaves us with one extra pin that is not explained yet, which is the LD pin. The LD pin, oh, by the way, LD stands for load, L-O-A-D. It controls the direction. In other words, with RAM, unlike ROM, it is read only, but with RAM, it is read write capable. So when you want to read, you want LD to be, I cannot remember, okay? You can always hover over the pin and it describes itself. So if it is a one, we are reading. When it is a zero, we are overwriting. So the LD port is kind of like a direction control where you can specify, are we reading and we are treating the D port as an output or are we overwriting the content of RAM so that the D port is just as an input, okay? So that's the job of the LD port is to control which way are we accessing RAM? Are we reading or are we overwriting? Yes? A one line or a zero line? Um, a one is a read, a zero is a write. So is it, if, if you hover over it, it gives you like a, the description, but only for a brief moment. If it says load memory to output, we are reading. All right, so RAM is a little bit more complex. We'll continue to talk about RAM on next Tuesday. So for today, we are only doing the lab for the first part, which is this part here. Okay, this is uh, the first one of the components of the processor. I have not opened it up yet, so let me go ahead and do that so that you guys can access it. The um, access code is edgy, E-D-G-Y, but I have not uh, specified the open and due date yet so let me go ahead and do that it's going to do it's going to be due today this is not one of those things where i give you like a whole class period to do like it's a long weekend well it's not a long weekend but it's like five days since before we see again um it is october what oh, so today is october 3rd yep mm -hmm. And I want it to be due at the end of this class. So that's 11.50 a.m. October 3rd, 11.50 a.m. So the lab, okay, save and publish. If you refresh, you should be able to see it. And then use edgy, E-D-G-Y, as the access code to get into it. So the lab is actually also an assessment in some way of how well you are taking notes. Because in this particular case, it is only about registers and also the, the multiplexer. So that means if you have been taking notes and understanding the concepts as we go, you know, the lab should be relatively easy. It's still a little bit on the tedious side. But if you have not, it's okay. You can still look up the uh, built-in help in Logisim and read that as well. Um, and I'm gonna post the recording as soon as possible, and I will still be here to kind of answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, so I'm going to stop the recorder.